welcome uh, back to our meeting. It's nice to be close and cozy. Um, but uh, Andrew, uh, yeah, I guess you're up next from the highway agency. I am, in fact. And uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your usage of uh, these chemicals and why you uh, why you use them, or sure. what the purpose of use is, and we've gone from there. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Andy Shively. I'm the head of Substance Materials Coordinator for the Agency of Transportation. Uh, I've been in the position since about 2007, including membership as the appointee for VPAC, excluding two years in the interim when I ran the pesticide program for VTrans. Um, our program is primarily to establish safety and durability within the transportation infrastructure. That is why we use herbicides in the right of way. So we'll be very clear about it. We use primarily glyphosate. It is the predominant chemical we are going to use currently. And if we're prohibited from using that chemical, we're going to have to switch to a more harsher chemical. Um, the reality is, is I've heard that from Mike, I've heard that from many other people, including senators here, that that is the reality. We're going to be using more harsher chemicals to meet the same effective need to control vegetation in the right way. And it's all, you use this to control vegetation where? Primarily guardrail, but it also has a lot to do with safety relative to inspections, relative to the infrastructure itself of the transportation system. Uh, safety would be, as an example, poison ivy. You can't allow workers into an area of poison ivy to do inspections of a culvert exit. So you're going to have to treat that poison ivy before you allow employees in that area. So it's mainly guardrails, culverts. Driver cul culverts, mile marks, postages, signs, yes, exactly. Speed limit signs. Speed limit signs. Yeah. And how many, do you have an idea of uh, how much you use on an annual basis? It's been very sporadic over the last few years. Uh, last year, we averaged somewhere around ten to $15,000 worth of chemical. We've transitioned over the last few years to applying and treating ourselves. We aren't contracting up to outside contractors anymore. We are training up and providing our own applicating capacities within VTrans. Last year was one of the startup years for us doing that, so we didn't treat as much as we normally would have. And how did... It would be great if we could get on a, a downward swing of these things, and was your usage down uh, from the year before, do you know? Or? I think it would be really hard to compare those usages because they were so different amount of application. I think they're not, it's really difficult to make that comparison because they were so different. Years prior, the entire state, all the districts in the state applied to guardrail, and last year maybe only two or three districts really took the opportunity and, and applied. Why was that? Yeah. Mainly because, as I was saying, we were, we were going through a transition period where we we're tooling up our own people to be able to do do the application themselves, we're not quite up to that speed. Okay, so that's a really interesting moment in time where you could maybe compare the, the effects of lower usage during this transition to right. the effects of prior higher usage. Did you, did you do anything? I mean, were there negative impacts of not applying the, can, uh, the pesticides? Can I jump in because I'm confused? Sure. Are you saying that the pesticides weren't applied or that we contracted out for a bunch of them? I'm saying the, kind of the pesticides weren't applied. At all? At all. Yeah. Okay. So minimal so application throughout the years. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. The minimal the application question throughout is, throughout did here. anything bad happen? Uh, I, anything good happen? <laughs> I didn't take any of that into account, quite honestly, when I came here to, to speak about this, so I didn't really come prepared to provide. Well, these, I, are, I don't, these are moments when actually like yeah. something something happens that uh, you didn't intend, so that, you, but it's a, a point in time when doing research is really interesting because you didn't intend necessarily to right, have a drop still. in pesticides usage. Right. But it happened because of this change in your policy and your you know, use of staff and, and that's great. Right. So really trying to understand what, what, what were the effects of this unintended um, 
drop in the use of pesticides and 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 did it have a harm, harmful implications to the safety of workers and to the you know safety of drivers and uh, etc or did it not you know those, so those would be interesting questions to try to tease out of this unintended experiment understood and i got your point it feels like a missed opportunity because yeah. i don't have those answers for you Okay. I don't have these answers. Yeah, and Frost never came out of the ground up north where I live, so they didn't have to spray. <laughs> <laughs> All summer it was frosty up in the Northeast Kingdom. Hey, can you, just along these lines, um, what is the safety, like what's the strategy around a speed limit sign? Or, around a speed limit sign? Well, or, or some of the signs, I, I'd like to understand the logic that says you know, there's a, so you made the point about a worker that has to go to inspect something. So they're sure. protecting them from poison, poison ivy. Sure. It seems sure. like some boots could work, but okay, let's, we'll accept that. What What is the logic of needing to spray? Why do we need to spray around the signs? Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll start with the Federal Highway does require us to maintain the infrastructure under a certain measurable condition. That means, as an example, being able to see the guardrail. Uh, being able bags. to see the reflective roadside delineators, being able to see in a line of sight around a turn that isn't encroached by a, a large piece of grass or a lot of vegetation growing up. So that there's a bags. lot of safety components that are kind of inherent to the way the system operates that yeah. you don't normally notice until they're really bad. Okay. The beds require this, like on the federal highway system? Yeah, if HWA requires that we maintain our sure. infrastructure system in a certain measurable manner. But, but okay, so that, that they don't require that we spray with glyphosate. So, so take the next step for me in the logic. The next step for you in the logic of why we spray? Yeah, so let's go back to the speed limit sign. Sure, sure. Let's go back to You're the speed maintaining limit sign. that it's for safety that we spray right. around a speed limit sign. So. I don't understand that. So explain that to me in a way that I'll understand why safety dictates spraying a speed limit sign on the highway. Uh, I put you on the spot. I'll, I'm happy to speak if you, okay, to, if you want me to. I love Mike. He's great. We have a, we have a thousand miles of, of guardrail to maintain. So in a sense, we're talking about an argument of economics. Um, the cost of using those traditional chemicals compared to the manual methods that would be required to achieve the same vegetation outcomes would be tremendous. I've looked at numbers. There are so many different variables away how you want to look at it. It's pretty clear that it would be an increase in cost, and it would be substantial. To, to use but, mowing, for example? To use non-chemical means. Weed whacker. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I see the guys plowing the highway, you know, mowing along the highway. Sure. So, so we do that. Right. Are we saying that, um, so I, I, I really, I don't mean to pick on this no, speed limit okay. sign, but it's just an example of it seems like a fairly innocent little signpost there. So what... And we're already going to mow there. Sure. So what are we gaining? I, I'm really, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not understanding. I think I'd rather, can we pick on guardrails? Sure. Because <laughs> I think there's more of an implied reality that that's a safety component. So it's A speed limit sign, you, we both know if you knock somebody over speed, uh, knock over a speed limit sign or people don't see it, they're going to speed either way. Right. The example, <laughs> the example, this is Mike Bald was from the rail lines, the, when, the, yeah. when the train conductor has to be able to see those and they spray out carry nose, they spray 20, 10, 20 feet in front of it and 10 feet behind it, because you can't have Phragmites encroaching, uh, okay, cover up so. a sign saying crossing ahead. Right. Yeah, Can I interject just really quick with you for a week? This, these are the conversations, Kerry Jagari didn't say that, that happen at the council in and around the, each entity's vegetation management plan. And everybody who asks for a permit has a vegetation management plan that describes the safety issues associated with the treatment that they mm -hmm. want to do. And I'd be more than happy to provide the vegetation management plans for each entity. That would be great. And it, it sort of, you know, has right. an example of one. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. How many are there? <laughs> About 18. So, so, all right, so the guardrail. So were we less safe last summer when, when a small percentage of them were treated. 
No, because it's more, as Mike would kind of note, it's a cumulative effect. There's other components like erosion control and the uh, accumulation of vegetation around the edge of pavement that might channelize water and go to a weak spot and create an aggravated erosion scenario where if that vegetation didn't exist or it had been removed prior, you wouldn't get that kind of accumulative effect. So that's just on the erosion control side of things, and as opposed to um, line of sight, that's that's a completely different kind of a kind of a issue to talk about. There, there's two different things here that, in, in my mind. There's the public safety component that those who use the transportation infrastructure, uh, and then it's the impact itself on the infrastructure and how it reduces the durability over time. And that's a little bit more difficult to talk about on a year-to-year -year basis. Mm -hmm. You can't say just because we didn't do it this year, we had this one erosion scour. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying that couldn't be the case. It could very well be the case. But it's not as easily tracked as that. Right, mm -hmm. so I understand that the long-term impact on infrastructure, you can't do in a one year. But you could do, you could determine about safety in terms of whether or not they were blocking the guardrails yeah. in a way that was I guess I want to get back to a question that Senator Pearson asks because I don't think I understood the answer. I mean, if we're already out there mowing, how is it more expensive or less expensive to be out there than applying glyphosate? So we don't mowing under the guardrails, and we're treating using the chemicals specifically to treat under under the, the guardrails. guardrails. So where you we're can't not get chemical it mowing, mow. we're, okay. mow, we're treating a two-foot swath under the guardrail Got where it. we can't mow. Okay. So that, in effect, affects the durability and the longevity of the guardrail system over time, over a long period of time. And that, sorry, I'm that is a use that the impact hasn't allowed. States like Maine do chemical mow. Right. They treat their entire right-of-way with an herbicide that stunts the grass. Mm -hmm. So other states allow chemical mowing, um, allow invasive species control on a right-of-way, allow the flower beds to be put in. Those are all uses that VPAC does not allow VTrans to do. Could oh. I get a permit to, to use chemical uh, mowing on my front lawn? You wouldn't need a permit, but you could. Half rain of a sulfonyl urea would do it. I get very it. sick of that mowing. <laughs> <laughs> I could spray that. Put in rock gardens. I wonder if your garden doesn't grow. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, coming from all. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you the roadsides. I don't know how you determine who mows and when, but always down in southern Vermont, they're nicely mowed. And the further north you get, mm. the later you get mowed, and it isn't very attractive for uh, guests coming to our state to go from a nice landscape roadside to uh, to the mess that we have up north later in the summer, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Was there a question there? I can't yeah. no. Mike, Mike, has, Mike has an answer for a question I'm not sure exists, but go ahead. Well, Mike Baldwin, um, there's an organic farm. They're not certified organic, but you, you, could, you could get input. There's a farmer in North Pomfret and four other landowners who don't want wild parsnip in, in the bowl of land that they inhabit. 20 landowners, five of them have hired me. No wild parsnip because you get the sap on you, you're screwed, you're, you're losing eyesight, you're, you're second degree burns. This, this landowner and her brother, they mow roadsides for miles at their own cost, at their own expense, at their own time, they're farmers. They don't get any money from me, they don't get any from the state, they do their, their poor neighbor, their rich neighbor. They do that at their expense because they don't want the mowing to spread the, the weed seed. Now I'm on the weeds, so I keep, there's no, you will not find parsnip in the 20 square miles of North Pomfret where I work. But they don't want chervil and they don't want to use pesticides, but they get zero funding support from the state or from another, it's out of their pocket. That's, I think that's broken. But that's what they have to do. That's a town mowing scenario. Sorry. Okay. Uh, other questions? Uh, 
uh, Brian. Yep. So if a glyphosate became unavailable to you, what would you be using? We'd likely be using the sulfamethoron pro products, like uh, oust, as an example. It's going to be a vegetation. It's a grass control. Uh, we'd like to have to follow that up with a brush or a tree control, like a triclopyr or uh, I'd maybe a granite, but I doubt we'd go there. Uh, we would have to use a harsher chemistry, and we'd have to apply multiple applications. So it would be more harsher, more often treatment. Thank you. Did, yeah. did you go to your in-house applicators as a cost-saving measure, or because you thought they were better trained or better at the job? Or? I think it's a combination of a lot of things, including all of those. Do you feel like control would be would have been another? Yeah, I was just about to say you have more control over when and how and how much. And administratively, it was a challenge to manage contractors. Yeah, there were a lot of reasons. Control being one of them, from a timing standpoint, from a effectiveness standpoint. Do you think you might be able to manage those in-house staff toward a goal of reduction in use? I think we already are. I think that's what our goal is and always has been. Do you keep, do you have long-term statistics on how much you use? Oh, yeah, we have to We have to report annually on, to the agency ag as part of our permit on okay. how much we use. And does that, do those statistics show that your I, use I, is going down? I, I don't think this most recent bump shows that. I think the drop in, in this inconsistent year yeah. kind of throws that in kind of in disarray. Mm -hmm. There's lots of ways to look at that number. Do you want to look at overall use or do you want to use that pounds per thousand feet of guardrail? Pounds per thousand feet, I think, would be the most important because if you can get that reduced, there's less chance for runoff. To right. So there's lots of ways to do that. And if we keep putting in guardrail, that final number is going to keep going up. And we, there's a mandate to. Is this, right. <clears throat> does that change uh, the amount of guardrails so the feds demand that or, or no, how I think the, that? The need for guardrails is more of an independent process so based on site by site needs, not necessarily whether the feds require it in any one shape or form. It's site specific, the need for guardrail. But that's to prevent people from getting hurt, supposedly? It's, it's always generally grounded in a safety, safety issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, distance to yep. the river, whatever the case may be. Um, any uh, roads? I have one more. Uh, so I, I know part of our water quality um, plans are for you to do, or V-Trans, not you personally, maybe you personally, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, might be. Um, <laughs> to do different plantings <clears throat> along um, when there's a new highway put in. So New construction. New construction. Yeah. D different plantings, culverts, uh, all the whole shebang. Right. And one example that I see all the time is in northern Addison County, southern Chittenden County along Route 7. You re a couple of years ago, we did Route 7 along there and put in a lot of different plantings, planted a lot of trees. It's yep. the sort of Ferrisburg, Charlotte area. Yep. Yep. And I'm wondering, does that have an impact does on pesticide, uh, on glyphosate use? Does it increase it or decrease it? Or? I'd say it has no impact. No, the, only imp the impact really for that stretch would have been extending the gravel apron beyond the edge of pavement so you're not establishing a zone for vegetation to be able to creep into. Okay. So we're trying to engineer out the need to even tree underneath. Right, that's what I'm talking about. I'm wondering if... So if the vegetation itself and the, what you described, no, that's not really going to impact the use of glyphosate, but just the engineering of the guardrail system itself will, because now that guardrail may not necessarily need treatment ever or maybe for a long time mm -hmm. based on encroachment. Okay, so I guess my broader question is, you're... Uh, are, you're implementing practices that might change the infrastructure along the roadways. Correct. That that could intent, with an intention to reduce pesticide use overall. Okay. That's good. Uh, and I'm just curious, how many, when you talk about these in-house applicators, how many are there? Oh boy, Jen, I'm going to look at you. <laughs> my my counterpart, Jen Callahan, works with well, two lines, and I, I think um, we're pushing. We have at least one in each district, so that, and most districts 
we try and get at least two yeah. per district. We have turnover, so we're constantly retraining and, and getting more people up. But we have nine. Well, how many is that? Yeah, eight. 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 And, and I think what our goal is to basically be able, be able to have them operate in teams. So have and are they team. actually walking along the guardrails like with this implement spray in the weeds? And the no, it's in a truck. Okay. No, it's truck mine and spray, spray application. They do they do reconnaissance prior to that to mark their, their buffer distances to waters or whatever conditions v, uh, VPAC may impose on, on the road. Then the truck is going along the road at some slow pace and they're, they're okay. spraying while the truck moves? Exactly, with a train of traffic control behind them. So you, you right. imagine the equivalent of a high school kid going along with a weed whacker like <laughs> the statistic I, I have that is I may get a little wrong, so bear with me, was an example would be maintaining the Champlain Causeway, which we cannot use any herbicides on, and we have to maintain mechanically, so that's literally weed whacked. And I think it takes three people 10 days to treat, to control the vegetation on what, a 10 mile stretch of the causeway. So if you extrapolate that out to Main, managing the entire infrastructure system, it starts to look like really big numbers. And why are you not using, why can't you use it along the Champlain Causeway? Because it's too close to the so lake. To the middle of the lake. Oh, it's the middle of the lake. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Causeway. I was thinking of the, yeah, road that goes up. No, the, 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 the bike path Causeway. Sure. Got it, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had those new workers that yeah. were hospitalized. Yeah. The, the, that's another yeah, we're thing. Rebacking is definitely dangerous. <laughs> but that's more disruption. Ten. Ten miles? Ten miles. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for your time and, and uh, appreciate the opportunity yeah, to be brief. <laughs> may I ask a quick question? Have you experimented with acetic acid? I mean, it kills you what? Vinegar? Vinegar. Vinegar. It's going to kill, kill them quick. I don't know if. AFFM would permit that for us. Well, that's, a good, that's a good question. Yeah. Acidic acid will, will kill plants very quickly. It doesn't kill them. It's like steam. It burns the top. It doesn't affect oh, their root weed structure. It will kill the top, and then the plant won't grow any higher. Yeah. But if you spray it, it could. Yeah, but we, but the, we, don't look, we don't lessen any toxicity. Acidic acid? Correct. I'm exposed to vinegar almost every day in my home. This is 20%. 20% percent of seed. Yeah. Uh, Have there been experiments? Yeah. Um, thank you. For the record, my name is Margaret Lagus, and I represent Green Mountain Dairy Farmers and Crop Life America. Um, pesticide use in Vermont has been on a steady decline for the last several years, um, and there are really two reasons for that. Um, the first is that pesticides are expensive, and um, yeah. obviously farmers are always looking for a, a way to save money. The second is that there's constant ongoing research in integrated pest management systems that help farmers find, way, find ways to handle weeds and pest pressures without the use of outside inputs. Um, there are also corn breeding programs that are looking into creating crops that are more resistant to pest and weed pressures. There's also the use of satellite technologies by um, tractors so that the pesticides are only sprayed in the areas of the fields, fields are scouted and then the boom only sprays exactly where they're needed. So there, there are kind of a variety of reasons why that might be, why those numbers are going down. Um, Vermont's actually one of the few states that actually has done quite a bit of research on these particular pesticides that you're talking about today, predominantly uh, neonics and glyphosate, and whether or not there's a movement in the environment of these products from their targets. And I think you heard on glyphosate that there are not, the state has done extensive testing there and they have not found that they've moved away. You heard just last week about neonics as, as far as treated seeds, the work that was done at Minor Institute, not only on um, the water that was coming out of the tile drainage and into ditches, but also to the non-target species, the goldenrod that was in the, in the ditch and they didn't find any movement of the neonics into, that, into those plants. Then they also looked at beeswax. They also didn't find it um, in the beeswax, although they did find some of the chemicals that um, you know, bee folks are using um, to kill varroa mites. Um, so Vermont's agricultural practices have changed dramatically in the last 10 years. For, for anybody who has lived here, you know that for decades you would drive by cornfields and they were tilled twice a year. You would see them, they were bare, the earth was turned over. Um, that really was used as a, as a method of disturbing the pests that were in the soil. You turn up that soil, 
pests like to live within their own stati uh, strata in the soil, you turn it over, you disrupt their lives and you reduce their, their numbers and their ability to, uh, to kind of procreate the way that they would like to. Um, that also obviously reduce weed pressures. You turn them upside down and, and hopefully those weeds are gonna die back and they're not gonna be um, as vibrant. Um, as you know, over the last five years or so, and especially after the um, initiation of the RAPs, the Required Ag Practices, farmers have adopted uh, two major new methods of farming uh, on their corn land, and that is uh, no-till or reduced tillage and leaving cover crops on the fields over the winter. So now you don't see fields turned up twice a year. So that also saves on you know, tractor trips as well. Um, Invert nationally, cover cropping covers about 22% uh, of all uh, corn acres. In Vermont, we're on average 30%, and in the in the actual watershed districts, the when they look at the um, like the Champlain Valley Watershed um, Group, which covers Addison and Chittenden County, um, they're up to over 60% cover crop. So we've made a dramatic increase in that uh, practice among those farmers that are really looking at that and, and um, trying to start using those means. Um, what that means is that soil has an, a higher organic matter content because as those weeds die down, they basically die into the soil and um, become incorporated into the soil over time, like composting, basically. Um, it means that both weed and pest pressures are increasing and rapidly changing in Vermont because we're not turning up the soil, so we're not disturbing the pests in their, in their natural habitat, kind of, and so they're, they're kind of growing and changing. We've got fungi in the soil that's kind of doing the same thing. And, all of that, that whole biota is changing and, it's, and it's, it's something that Vermont farmers haven't dealt with in the past. So we're learning a lot and UVM Extension is doing a lot of research on like, what's going on under the soil now. It's very different than it was just five to 10 years ago. Um, and on top of that, our weed pressures are completely different because we're not, we're not always killing back the weeds as, as much as we did before. Um, on top of that, Vermont has seen, as I'm sure you've heard a couple of different times, um, especially in northern Vermont, an increase in 10 inches of rainfall a year um, in northern Vermont over the last decade or so. Um, the, the, the good news is that because of the RAPs and the cover cropping and the increase in organic matter in the soil, that has had less of a negative impact on Vermont farms than it would have if farmers hadn't dramatically adopted those practices. 1% increase in organic matter in the soil holds about 20,000 gallons of water per acre. That's a lot of water, so that's great for your crops. Um, it kind of puts down some of that Rodale, you know, research where they said, you know, organic farmers are so much better off than conventional farmers. We're now kind of coming up to the same standard because we're, we are increasing our organic matter in the soil. And so we are competitive with those numbers as to how much water we can hold. The beauty of that is twofold. It's not only great for our crops, but it's great for roads and bridges and, and water quality because that water is not leaving our field. It's, you know, these, these much larger two inches or more individual rain events would have been washing a lot more water off of those fields into ditches, into streams, causing erosion and you know hurting so, roads and bridges. And one acre holds 20,000 20, gallons mm -hmm. for one percent increase in organic matter, um, that's and that's research. Two mm -hmm. tractor trailers that haul gas or oil. Right, the big ones. Is yeah, two of them. Right. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's a lot. Of it's a lot of water. Yeah, and, it's, and that is really important because Vermont is, is having this weird, these big weird weather changes where we're getting these big rain events and then potentially longer periods of time with no rain and then these huge rain events. So it's really important that the soil become more like a sponge. It's really important. Um, and so it was brought up a little bit earlier that you know, if Vermont just wanted to, we should just tell the, you know, the uh, pesticide companies that we want changes or we want crop changes and so on. We're, we're, you know, a flea on the tail of a dog as far as a crop producing state. So those companies are really not going to look to Vermont for a, a sales or marketing opportunity. They, they almost write us off half the time because we've, you know, we've got 100,000 acres of corn. You know, there, there are farms out west that are, you know, almost 100,000 acres of corn on a farm. So it's just very, very different. Um, you know, we just don't have any market authority, really. Um, I talked about the fact that Vermont actually has information on whether or not glyphosate is leaving farms and, and having a negative impact. We have not found that glyphosate is doing that. Um, it is a very important tool for farmers um, with regard to cover cropping. Um, so, so we would obviously prefer that you not take it away from us. Um, organic farming has its place in the market, and, and you heard earlier that uh, NOFA really wants to encourage more and more people to get into organic farming. Um, it's really not 
uh, reasonable to believe that the marketplace could, could, could sustain all farms in Vermont being organic. And what we already know within just the realm of dairy, I don't know that much about fruits and vegetables, but with, in dairy, they're not taking any new organic dairy farmers. Their, their market is as saturated almost as much as conventional farmers are. They've seen a reduction in their quota system that they have that sadly conventional farmers are just starting to get into. Um, and they're not taking new, uh, new farmers. So there, there's just no room for, for more folks to, to turn to be organic. Um, currently, several farms in Vermont, and I, I just called around to um, a couple different agronomists to find this out, um, who are planting non-GMO crops uh, due to the fact that they have a market opportunity to grow non-GMO corn, um, have found that they have had a significant increase in wireworm in Vermont in the last few years, part of that due to some of the cover cropping and the climate change issues that are going on, that's what neonics go after. And what these farms had to do this last year was to, was to put the neonic in the, um, in the pesticide box as they planted their corn. The rate of neonic application as a side dressing versus as a seed treatment is 10 times the level. Um, so you're literally putting 10 times as much neonics into that field in order to deal with that infestation than would be if you if they were able or wanted to take advantage of just using a, a neonic treated seed. Um, uh, so there's a dramatic increase. If you grow corn and use non-GMO neonic, yep. you're, you're good to sell it as non- Correct, you, you, correct. you can- you side dress, you can still sell it. All, all, the, all the buyer wants is non-GMO. They're not caring about the pesticide application. What they want is the non-GMO corn. So they, they don't care whether the corn is treated or not, or at least in these sales markets, they don't. What they care about is non-GMO. And that's, you see a lot of food products that say non-GMO. They don't say pesticide free, but they say non-GMO. Um, so that, that is a, a niche market that is out there and, and is growing. Um, as I said, Vermont research has shown, shown that both neonics that's, and glyphosate that's your, <laughs> are staying where they are put and not hitting non-target like species. Milk. Right, exactly. <laughs> Nut juice, we call it. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and this is really the most important consideration for Vermont is, are these pesticides that are being used in Vermont having negative impacts on either the humans in Vermont or the environment in Vermont? Not what's happening nationwide or someplace else. What we care about is what is happening here and how your actions are going to affect the farmers in Vermont and, your, and the health of the humans that live in Vermont. Um, when we look at um, neonics and, uh, and bees, what we learned was that it's like number four or five on the, on the, on the negative impacts that, that bees are having for oomites. And tracheomites are like number one. Yeah. yeah, we've got we've got a lack of genetic diversity. We've got climate change. We've got a lack of early forage for bees. Those are all big problems. Then pesticides come in. It's usually number four or five that's mentioned. Um, so so it's really pretty far down the list. And corn is not a, a bee pollen source. And so even though we are uh, growing neonic treated seeds and that uh, the neonics can show up in the corn pollen, they're not really negatively impacting bees. Um, seed treatments use significantly less volumes of pesticides, like I talked about before. It's almost 10 times the volume that would be on a treated seed. Um, and so that has a lot of benefits to, you know, the reason that we started doing seed treatments was because you used to have every single farm had bags of these fungicides and pesticides. They put them in their planters. The, the employees would be mixing them up. You'd get these red arms because they, they have colors. Um, and then you would be planting them. And so every single, so you basically had pesticides spread out at every single farm in Vermont. So they were A, at the store, wherever you were buying them, then they were taken to the farm, they were stored there. There was potentially unused, obsolete, or you know, eventually banned products sitting at these farms all over the place. The agency runs a program to try to pick up all these products. You know, then you went to a seed treatment and all of a sudden you got rid of those problems. Um, you got rid of your employees being exposed to them. You got, you, got, you really, it, it, there was an environmental benefit. So a lot of people are like, why in the world would you, would you do this? And why are they potentially used prophylactically? Well, that's one of the reasons is you keep all these products off of farms. You may be using some more um, or some in areas where you might not actually have a, a pest pressure that's present right then, but you have significantly lessened the environmental and human in health impacts of pesticides being out there. Um, so for some, for some of the pests that neonics go after, there's very little opportunity to know that an invasion is pending. Go ahead. 
Well, food sure sent me. Okay. So I was just going to say that for some of them, like wireworm and some of those pests that neonics go after, it's getting harder and harder to predict in the fall whether or not you're going to have a spring invasion and therefore you would be able to order your seeds ahead of time. And in some of those places where they have banned neonic treated seeds, like Ontario, they have found that the um, their ministries of agriculture have had to allow a lot of either side dressing or the use of these treated seeds in the intervening years because they have had these pest pressures that have come along. Margaret, at the beginning you said that overall pesticide use is down in Vermont and Carrie handed us this chart a few weeks ago that does not say that picture, in fact paints a picture of more use in the last decade. So are you talking about acres treated or I was literally or, looking at the at the bar graph from the digger story which has showed in the last five years that there's been a, a fairly decent decline in overall pesticide usage I think you're looking at individual pesticides versus overall usage over time yes. maybe um, so that might be the difference um, you've certainly seen an uptick, uptick in glyphosate and then recently you've seen an uptick in in atrazine um, so yeah. you have seen those too. Over the, last decade, um, the other thing I would say is that most of the large companies the, the, um, that are developing these chemistries, like Bayer, like Corteva, like some of these others, are looking more to biological controls. They're looking at ways to create either products that help a plant protect itself um, or to create the plants themselves that don't mind the incursion of a, of a bug, you know, that don't, that don't. One of, the, one of the big problems is you want to protect uh, corn from these incursions from some of these pests because once there is an incursion, then you get a mold in there called mycotoxin that causes abortions in cows. It's a, it's a very lethal, it's a, a really difficult disease to control. You get mycotoxins in your corn and then you have to treat your whole corn pile for it. It's like a, a fungus that gets in there and it gets in there because it gets into that little cut that the, that the bug made in the corn plant. So they're looking at a variety of ways of trying to create corn plants that either that can stand being bitten on by a bug and then not creating that mycotoxin um, in reaction to that. Um, and also being able to grow under more and more weed pressures as well to be able to withstand that weed pressure and still survive and thrive. So they, they are looking at a lot of different ways. It's not that they're not sensitive to, the, to what um, consumers are wanting, which is less and less pesticide use and more biological or IPM controls. Um, the issue is it takes a long time to, to create these products, 10, you know, five, 10 years before they can get to the marketplace. So it's slow, but it's definitely coming. And, we're, and those of us who grow crops have definitely seen that. There's a big change in the kind of corn plants that are being grown in Vermont than there were you know, 10 years ago. Um, talked about water retention, how important that is. Um, uh, and then I, I just want to read you just a, a little uh, section from Governor, Cuono, <coughs> Governor Cuomo's veto message on the chlorpyrifos ban in New York, which was passed by the legislature. Um, and in his message, he, um, he basically he rejected the bill because it bypasses the rigorous process available to challenge an approved product and substitutes the legislature's judgment for the expertise of chemists, health experts, and other subject matter experts in the field. And basically what he's saying is that there's a regulatory process in place and that's what we should follow when we think that we have chemicals of concern in Vermont. Um, you know, Kerry took the opportunity to not re-register chlorpyrifos in Vermont. That's exactly the way that it should have happened. It shouldn't be a political process where social media is getting people all hyped up about a variety of things, and then the legislature steps in and does things um, potentially without regard to actual science. We have the science on the ground in Vermont. These products are not, a, um, you know, are not causing problems. You know, where they don't belong, um, and therefore we should not be having the legislature try to, to ban or restrict their use. Climate change is real in Vermont. Farmers are facing it in a dramatic way, and these are just tools that we can use. And they're becoming technically, in some ways, more and more important because we are having, you know, army worms and, and um, black fungus and wire worms are all things that are increasing over time in Vermont, not decreasing. Yeah. And these are the chemicals and these are the, the opportunities that we have to protect our crops from their uh, negative effects. Yep. Are there questions for Margaret? I, I just have. A, mm -hmm. I, I had a comment, but I'll that but I do have a question because one of the sentences and I wish I'd written it down you said about protecting the health of Vermonters and mm -hmm. pr you farm said protecting employees. farmers yep. and farming abilities and the health of Vermonters or mm -hmm. something and uh, farmers are people in Vermont and mm -hmm. you know they they themselves need to be protected yep. against the harm of mm -hmm. potential harm of, of pesticides 
and I do appreciate the difference. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. when I was a kid going to farms and just seeing, you know, the seeds being just like sprayed, and yeah, that's, so it's changed, and it's clearly a lot safer for farmers themselves, but I'm wondering if you know of any studies about the, you know, health of farmers as over the long term with the use of pesticides specifically. I mean, I know that there was one referenced earlier in earlier testimony, but I, as someone who represents farmers, I would just, I'm assume that this is a concern of yours, of their their families, their their workers, and their health, and whether or not us enabling these to be used, maybe maybe they see a quote a potential economic benefit, but they may not see a, their own personal health benefit. So I think what you would find is that uh, most of these products um, are uh, restricted use, and so they're all uh, they're not applied by farmers. They're all applied by commercial applicators, and very few farmers are commercial applicators. They hire somebody to come in and do it. So farmers are not being exposed to these pesticides on their own farms anymore. Um, and if you are going to start requiring that, A, you, you can't use them prophylactically, so you can't use a seed treatment, and you have to use a side dressing, then those products are going to show up on that farm, be mixed on that farm. And even if the farmer isn't doing the mixing, it's a commercial applicator, those products are still traveling over Vermont roads where you could have an accident, then they're showing up at a farm, they're getting mixed in a box, which is out in the open, potentially you know, with some dust off or whatever right in that area. So I, I think that seed treatments are significantly more healthy for not only Vermont farmers, but their employees but than the others. glyphosate isn't used as a seed treatment. That's nope, actually it's a, applied. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, but that is also generally applied by a commercial applicator, not applied by a farmer. It doesn't have to be applied so by a commercial they, applicator. But, they, but the farmers are still on the farmer's land, and the farmer's yeah. still yeah. You know, farming that crop that mm -hmm. has had the glyphosate applied to it, yeah. so they're still exposed to it. Yeah, glyphosate has a very short half-life compared to almost all of its um, chemical or chemistry counterparts. Um, some, some of its um, competitive, uh, you know, options have half-lifes in the, in the multiple days and weeks, and it has in the, in the hours to days, um, especially in sunlight predominantly, and you're only supposed to apply glyphosate on a, on a sunny day. It does break down um, in the sun fairly quickly, so, and it doesn't generally move to water, and so that's, those are the big benefits of glyphosate, and it does make it significantly safer than the other products a farmer might use, which then persists in the, in the environment much longer. So glyphosate is significantly safer for the farmer than, than its counterparts are. With, with the new type uh, computerized sprayers, mm -hmm. uh, do farmers know uh, how much they, how many pounds of this they need per acre in different spots, uh, or is it just three? So pounds? no. So generally, what happens is you'll 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 mix a tanker for the farm. And then you plug in all of the testing that you've done into the computer on the on the sprayer. And as the sprayer goes, one boom goes, or a piece of a boom, and another boom goes. And it all goes. And there's a big map in front of you that shows where you need to spray and where you where it's not going to be spraying. And so the tractor kind of follows that pattern. Um, and then you know at the end of the day, it's basically you know you're you're done, or it's going to go and get used on another farm. Um, but it's so they definitely know how much is used, and that they're going to be paying their applicator per ounce of product generally it's you know it used to be pounds of product now we're down to ounces per acre of product and sometimes even less than that i mean we've had a dramatic reduction in the volume that goes on and what they've done is they've made it better what they call a surfactant so you've got the the chemistry itself and that goes into something else that's either an oily product or something else that then makes the a chemical itself spread out more and then stick to the leaves itself and not leave its target species and drop to the ground or whatever um, and so it's really over the years it's been a big change in the surfactant which has really allowed these chemistries to be applied at a, at a smaller and smaller yeah. per acre. But, that, but yes, you pay per ounce or pound that of product. That machine that, that they use is... If you guys yeah. have a little TV, I'd love to bring you the, the John Deere has a great little video oh, about it all. It's really us. cool. It's super cool <laughs> we to watch. Really I know. <laughs> well, I, I did. I showed the Energy and Technology Committee on my, on my, on my um, iPad but when the, I was up uh, there. But yeah. The reason they're using professional applicators is because of the cost of that you machine that, that actually yeah. applies the product. And, yeah. and it, probably, it must be safer for everybody. Uh, Anytime you can use less, it's better. It yeah. saves you money and it protects the environment. There's no, you know, no farmer wants to be out there spraying, 
you know, pounds of product that they don't need. I mean, farmers are under the gun to save money every single day, and there's just no way they're out there throwing their money away. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a question for Margaret. We haven't heard from uh, power companies or, or people with rights of ways either, right? Yeah. I mean, I assume yeah, that the same action. situation exists, that they're right. using something. The pipeline, oil, Portland pipeline yep. people. Uh, Green Mountain Power. power. They'll go, yep. Yeah, yep. we haven't heard from them, but we'll... I, I would suggest, Senator, that uh, it, they would use whatever we permit them to use. So if we take glyphosate out of the rotation, they'll come in with another product. There are a lot more products that uh, for them to choose from. Their main, they use a lot less glyphosate. Their primary use is a triclopyr, uh, Garlon 4, um, so they can do basal bark treatment. Glyphosate doesn't work well for what they want to do. Um, they need a product that permeates uh, tree bark. Um, so they do basal bark application, so they'll cut, and then they'll cut, and then stump treat, and they need something in an oil that penetrates the cambium of that cut stump. Yeah. Um, so glyphosate is not high on our list. Uh, Triclopyr really is. Um, they use phosamine ammonium a lot as well. That's what they use elsewhere. So whenever they come to a road crossing, they'll treat that tree, and what will happen is when winter comes, the leaves will fall off the tree and they won't come back. So you won't see the brown out that you see from a Roundup application. Um, so the utilities, they do use glyphosate, but primarily it's a slew of other products that they okay. use. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, we had a couple of more names on our list, but Covey, Bordeaux, and... and uh, Brad Laws, and we'll have to get get back to them. Uh, but we have a meeting we're supposed to be at right now, oh. some of us. Yeah. But it's been a very um, interesting morning, and the subject is uh, really important to all of us. So thank, thanks a lot for participating, and... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Thanks, everyone.